Hello. Oh, hello. hello. Oh, it's me. Hey, big yeah. breath, big sigh. That was um, uh, that was the most unprofessional I've ever been um, when people were warming up for that podcast. But well, not even warming up. We started recording. I did a huge breath, and we had to stop recording. I felt a bit embarrassed about that. But after that, what a cracking episode! Who's it with? It's with Natalie from Spiro Health, and she is an advanced biostructural correction chiropractor. So mm-hmm. we get into the body in some ways not not you know not in the weird way but like how to sit how to sleep how to stand the injuries we pick up uh, the things we might be doing wrong unknowingly that are affecting our bodies if creating aches and pains and things so yeah i feel like people are going to learn a lot i think you might have learned a lot too Andy. absolutely yeah i um i did learn a lot and i think um jam-packed full of practical tips which is always a good thing um no fancy gizmos needed um and she actually said the best chair is the ikea dining chair which Mm -hmm. i'm assuming is not in the same price bracket as a lot of the uh office stuff you are seeing these days so some really interesting uh revelations as well um and good tips for yeah sleeping standing and well there's a lot of hope in there isn't there because um you know it it sounds like abc can really uh sort your body out in a way that you might not think is possible yeah absolutely that was what it gave me because as i said in my story you know i had this sort of downward trajectory of more and more injuries less and less mobility until i find found abc and it really uh, it flipped my trajectory from a a downward spiral to an upwards one so yeah listen up listener Mm. if you are someone who needs a bit of help and hope with regards to your your body and your structure yeah enjoy hey listener if you're enjoying the insights and stories we share on our pod then don't miss out on any of our episodes hit the subscribe button to download and listen to our conversations at your convenience natalie welcome to the podcast Tell us, how does ABC differ from traditional forms of chiropractic care? And yes, that is the million-dollar question that I get asked most days, Rich. So ABC is an acronym for, it's quite a mouthful, Advanced Biostructural Correction. I studied in South Africa originally, and I did a, a technique of chiropractic called Diversified. So there's, I mean... Don't get me wrong, there's about 200 different types of techniques of chiropractic. So, and all of them work really well, I would say. And I was doing really well using my technique. When I came across ABC, it became way more predictable for me. I had people in my office going and experiencing miracles in their body every week, which is so rewarding as a, as a practitioner. Um, and what I would say is, Traditional chiropractic, it's all by hand, which is fantastic because you, you know, that's the healing power of, of what we do. But in traditional chiropractic, you are changing somebody's configuration of what's happening in their body, which gives them temporary relief, in my opinion. Whereas ABC is a, a longer term, more permanent, more transformational treatment because you fix the body, literally. I mean, that sounds like car salesy, but you do. You, f- you fix the body. And I, I've been doing it now for long enough to be able to to really say that with confidence. So we work with what the body can't fix so you can fix yourself. And okay. specifically, if you want to get specific. I'd like right? to get specific if that's all right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, Andy, the if you think about the spine, the spine has three curves to it. And from behind... Ideally, you want to be 100% straight, and it's made up of Lego pieces called vertebra, basically. And where those vertebra sit in terms of biomechanics and all the curves is really important for how it props us up because when you when you talk about posture, posture isn't something, and, and all you listeners out there are going, posture, and everyone sits up straight. Or as soon as I say a chiropractor, they're like, oh, you do chiropractic, and everybody sits up really straight. It's hilarious. Um you should not be thinking about your posture. It should just be there. It should be something that when you stand up, you, you're standing upright, you're breathing while your ribs are moving, while your head's in a good position. It's not, it's not a conscious thing. 
So that's one thing. Because a lot of people think, oh, I can do chin tucks. I can hang off the end of my bed to get the arch back into my neck. I can do, you know, these millions of exercises and stretches and actually pointless. Um, so back to structure. These Lego pieces or these vertebrae, they have millions or hundreds of muscles around them to stabilize them. We don't have muscles attached in the spine that can pull one vertebra backward on another. That's the only time as a human being we struggle to correct ourselves because otherwise we're designed to correct ourselves. That's one of the biggest premises of ABC. So when these bones go forward, and it doesn't have to be from, you know, major car accidents or rugby tackles or big falls or traumas. It can be from the things that we do every single day, like sitting in a certain position, working as we are now, like having this podcast or sleeping in bed. Where's your head? Where's your pillow height? You know, what's your mattress doing? And what shoes are you wearing? These have an impact on these little Lego pieces or vertebrae. So when bones go forward, i.e. your body looks more collapsed or more hunched over, we don't have muscles to pull that back. So once you've collapsed a vertebra, that's it for us. Now, instead of us falling over, the body's super clever and it, it twists up to compensate for that. So we don't fall over, we just twist up. But now these little twists happen from a really young age and change the biomechanics of the body. But they don't only change the biomechanics, they'll change how the blood flows. They'll change how the brain communicates with the nerves. They'll change, you know, how hormones are distributed around the body. So there's a whole lot of different things that can affect. But basically, it's these compensations or twists that create a pattern. And then when you use a body that's twisted up, you start wearing yourself out. So, you know, there's a lot of evidence of us reversing things like arthritis, reversing knee issues. There's x-rays pre and post of somebody having ABC, you know, one or two or three years later, and you're looking at completely different spine, completely different knees, completely different hips. It's fascinating. Yeah, it, it is fascinating. And I am a big advocate for for ABC. Um, my story, I think, is is probably quite a typical one in that I was – doing a lot of CrossFit at the time. Well, prior to that, I was doing a lot of football, soccer, and I had stopped playing soccer because I had injuries. And then I was doing CrossFit and I could do that for a while, but I would just, I just kept on picking up more and more injuries, shoulder injury, then elbow injury, chronic mid-back pain, then, then hip pain, and then Achilles pain, uh, Achilles. Uh, and it, my, my, my body was just like slowly declining. And this was around sort of age, age 28, 29. So still you know, a young, a young person I sh that I shouldn't have been going through those things. And I had tried regular chiropractic and, you know, those chiropractors were, were amazing people and super smart, but it, it wasn't working for me. You know, I'd get a little bit of temporary relief and then the pain would just come back in a different spot. And it was just like managing injuries until. I went to the biohackers meetup and uh, saw Natalie and her, her former uh, colleague, Stuart, giving a presentation. And I thought, ah, this might be what I needed. Like I couldn't go for the quick fix. I couldn't just go, all right, I want to, you know, I want to one session. I want to be fixed. I've realized I had to go on a long multi-year journey. And that's when I started at, at Spiro Health in Putney and really sad to change a lot of the things I did in my life. But over time, I, I did get relief. I don't have those same injuries. I'm still doing CrossFit at 37, still PRing my snatch age 37. So um, I'm, uh, yeah, definitely a big advocate. But um, yeah, what, what, what other kind of stories do you have of, of clients changing in, in ways such as I did? I mean, it's, it's not only sort of this age group, it's, it's also newborn. Newborn babies, unbelievable. I mean, I, I I do the smallest amount of work, not not much work with them because they're obviously, you know, super young and their bodies haven't gone through much of this, what I've spoken about. You know, they're not even sitting upright. So bones going forward and twisting up probably haven't even happened yet. But there's another system that we deal with, which is called the meningeal system. Um, for those listeners, anyone that's not familiar with that, meningitis is an inflammation of the meninges and the meninges is like a think of it like a skin that covers the brain and spinal cord it's got three layers to it which are usually really loose really really loose um, but when your body goes through twists and bends and shifts it gets tightened up so it starts to affect the nervous system directly so abc deals with those so we do structural care but we also do a very deep form of stretching on this meningeal tension so yes, from from babies with sleeping issues, you know, 
scoliosis, people with, you know, and they get told by orthopedics, nothing can be done, you know, other than surgery. And, and it's, it's not true. I've seen it with my own eyes. I've, I've got results in my own office of a change in, in scoliosis. It takes time. It's a scoliosis is a double compensation. So it's a, it's a twist on a twist. So it is complicated and it does take a long time, but it's hundred percent possible to help with that. Um, I mean, I've been in, I've been in tears with good friends of mine because they haven't moved a shoulder for, I don't know, five years. And then suddenly one appointment, not saying one appointment and it's fixed. I'm just saying along the line of the journey of fixing someone in a number of months or years, suddenly the shoulder just unlocks and they can just move their shoulder. And then it's like, it's a big moment. <laughs> wow. So can you talk a bit more about the, the patient journey and what you're actually doing? Because it sounds like when Rich came to it, he realized that it's maybe going to take longer, but obviously, as you said, the results last longer in many cases forever. So can you talk a little bit about the patient journey and, and what you're actually doing? So typically, you obviously assess the client, take a good medical history, orthopedic neurological tests, et cetera, take some postural pictures, x-rays if needed, et cetera. And then once you've looked at them and go, okay, listen, I can help you. And there's quite a clear definition of what we can and can't help with ABC. The three things that we do not work with is malignancy, fracture, and diabetic complications. Those three things we won't work with, but everything else, everything else, post-surgery, you know, lots of neurological conditions that people wouldn't touch with a barge pole if they were chiropractors. We are, we're there. Um, so people come in and we assess them we usually start with a three-month program. So it's called stabilization. We are seeing them twice a week. Uh, I say this because just by research that we do to transform the body using this technique, the quickest way to see the results is to come in two per week. Three per week doesn't really accelerate it too much. One per week is too small because people tend to mess themselves up in, in inverted commas with the, how they sit, sleep, and stand which I can get into a bit later on some tips on those things. But it's hard to fix a body and transform someone's spine if they keep going back into patterns and habits, you know, much like, you know, any kind of therapy you're going to have. Go back into old patterns and it slows you down. So typically it looks like that to start with, Andy. Uh, pain pain relief, this is the frustrating part for, for a practitioner. I've had people with disc injuries crawl into my office. They can't even walk through the door, literally crawling through my office into the treatment room and I, I do one session and they walk out and frustratingly in their head they're like wow I'm 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 almost there I mean I was I couldn't even walk when I went into this and it's a miracle it does seem like a miracle the healing and complete healing of the tissue and inflammation and etc hasn't happened but there's been so much neural tension released from the stretches we do and the the uh, biomechanics that we fix that the whole body just works completely differently very quickly but the the challenge is educating someone in the fact that it's not – your body will revert back to old patterns very quickly. This is why the program is three months and I see you twice a week. Mm -hmm. um, so frustratingly, we can get really good results really quickly. People breathe better. Clarity's there. You know, energy's up. You know, pain is, is 70 80% gone. And yet, you know, the education is, listen, this is an investment and this is going to take some time. <laughs> Yeah. And I think one of the things that I found fascinating was how the spine is a, a root cause for a lot of people's injuries. You know, someone might have uh, a knee injury and they go and get loads of physical therapy and you know, a massage around the quad and the calf, but nothing helps it. And then you fix their spine and their knee pain goes away. Uh, you see a lot of that. I see so much of it. And once, once I did ABC for myself, as in learned about it, uh, you know, cognitively, I was like, makes so much sense. It makes so much sense as to what the actual cause of that biomechanical problem in the knee is. So when someone comes in with a, you know, and they go, oh, I've had, I've had surgery, I've got cartilage issues, I've, I've torn ACLs with, without even having trauma, just running a marathon or something. And I, I don't touch the knee. I mean, I do very minimal work on the limb at all. And the knee straightens, it's the strength returns, they they can walk better, they can sit better, they can exercise, and I haven't even done any work on the knee. So yes, the spine is is the key. Mm. And then there's that 
idea that the spine can correct itself in all directions apart from from backwards is that just like a hypothesis is there like evidence for that how did how did that come into being that that concept yeah that is a good question i mean i'm probably not in a position now to give you but i could research that for you and give you some factual as to how they really picked that up because it was essentially three guys three main guys in the 1970s Jesse Jatkowitz was one of the main guys and just an absolute genius when it comes to biomechanics of the body. He can look at you from 20 meters away and tell you what's going on in your body. Um, so, yeah, I'll find out about that and, and give you some more on that, that topic. And can we move on to some of the things that are bad for our posture um, or maybe some of the activities that most damage our posture or some of the kind of shoes we're wearing, way we're sleeping, the things you mentioned earlier. Yeah, so just to keep it super simple, the the two things that you don't want to do with your spine is hyperflex it. So there's a natural, normal amount of flexion of the neck or the mid-back or the lower back, and then there's a natural or normal extension of the neck, extension of the thorax, and extension of the, of the lumbar spine. And if you stay within those realms, you'll be fine. As in, now I'm specifically talking about exercises. So no hyperflexion, no hyperextension, just as a, as a basic rule. Uh, so when you're doing things like weights, you just want to keep your body as neutral as possible. I mean, I remember when I was, um, working with personal trainers and when you're doing back or think that they'll, they'll, they'll specifically ask you to arch your back, like when you're doing a pull down to really activate those muscles and small things like that can really not create an injury there and then, but you do that on a daily basis, three, four, five times a week. And the likelihood of you pushing one of those bones forward or putting it into extension is really high. And then the likelihood of your body twisting up is high. And then, of course, your injuries come and little niggles come thick and fast eventually. Hmm. So, you, yeah. yeah, I was going to say that there, there's this idea that everyone should be doing yoga, but you have a lot of recovering yoga instructors in your practice, don't you? So what was super interesting about that is because I actually really enjoy yoga I knew it wasn't good for my body uh, personally. And so what we did is we we got together with about 20 yogis, really experienced yogis, just had some conversations with them. And a lot of them were saying, I mean, they've been doing some of them yoga for 20 plus years. And they were saying, it's interesting how their bodies are no longer able to do the poses as they've got further along in their careers. And I'm like, well, you, I mean, you'd think that you'd keep that that um what's the word elasticity and keep that stretching of the muscles because you're doing it so often so it would just be there flexibility would be there but slowly but surely they were losing it um so we worked with them and we came up with a yoga flow um spine friendly yoga flow i actually have it on my my website which isn't any hyper extension or hyperflexion but it does involve twisting because you can do things that twist you can laterally flex you know you can do a safe amount of flexion and extension I enjoy the breath work, the stress management of yoga. So that's, it's a pretty safe way to do yoga. There is ways that you can leave out certain poses. So if you are a, a yoga fanatic, if you're in your session with yoga, I would just look at reducing the amount of flexion and extension that you do, forcing your body. And also in certain poses that you're doing one side versus the other, sometimes it can get quite competitive and you, with yourself even, and you want to push that stretch. I wouldn't push your body into a stretch. Because when you are stuck in one of those twists or those configurations I speak about, if you are going to stretch out what the body is actually doing to stabilize you, you could really destabilize yourself and cause some big problems. Yeah, I think yoga is like the idea of having some flexibility is good taken to the extreme becomes unhelpful the same with like vegetables are good for you so let's only eat vegetables and you get you know all the complications that come with with veganism and, and the same with yeah probably strength training or running marathon runners who just have you know emaciated and things like that like we do we do need balance and it's sad to see that when people just that they think they're doing something good for themselves like yoga and they're actually harming themselves when they take it to the extreme two things in my office the main injuries come, well, actually three, let me talk about three. One, yoga. So people post yoga. Oh, I've been doing yoga for six weeks and I picked up this or that. Two is the deadlift in the gym. So the deadlift in the gym is a great exercise. I mean, let's face it, it really activates your posterior chain and it's wonderful. 
But the likelihood of you pushing or dragging a vertebra forward doing that is is very high. So I usually tell my clients to stay away from a deadlift if they can. And what's the third thing? Oh, well, how, how how do you feel about hex hex bar de- deadlifts? I've heard they are better. Yeah, look, there's there's some some different techniques. I was going to say that the technique is important, but also what's worth saying is it depends on the body. So I might do that deadlift and my body probably handles it quite well, but somebody else who's just twisted or just a little weak in that certain spot, it'll create an issue over time. You were going to talk about sleeping, Natalie, and I was looking forward to that. (laughs) Yes. So that was actually the third, the third thing that I see in the office that creates the most injuries or the people come in with is sleeping on a memory foam mattress. Memory foam. Okay. And it's a big one. It's a big one because most people have invested a lot of money in it and it's mm. so well marketed that you think you're investing in your health. But actually, I cannot fix a body that sleeps on a memory foam mattress. Mm. Wow. Why is that? So the the quality and the properties of the memory foam, I mean, I'm, have you have you slept on? Have you, have you used have to have one. On? Yeah, I've slept on a h- h- half half and half. I think so. It's the spring and then yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think I used to sleep on one of those. Well, the material itself, when you when you when you lie on it, you actually think it's quite firm, and you're like, well, this is great. But you do, and it does end up molding sort of into your body. So let's think about somebody now that's got these collapsed vertebrae that I speak about, these anterior vertebra, and then their body's twisted up, and then you get into bed. And all the bed does is mold into what your configuration is. So every night when you go to sleep, it's not like, you know, the next day you'll wake up and potentially be in danger. But over time, you're going to get more and more and more tightly twisted up than you would if you were sleeping on a firm mattress, because we we recommend firm. There's another f- type of foam at the moment that's the best that we can recommend called latex. So it's latex foam, essentially. Uh, you know, a lot of it can be organic and hyper hyperallergenic because memory foam can get really hot, and actually, it's quite toxic. <laughs> so, mm. Yeah, yeah, the toxicity of mattresses is is a raging topic in all the sort of health biohacking Facebook groups I go into. So, can you say more about that toxicity? I haven't actually looked into most of it. It's only just the materials. Um, actually, I think it was something that Tim had posted that I read about where there was Tim like, Gray five or six different points that he put together just saying that this is the most toxic substance in the world to not sleep on it <laughs> yeah i think yeah they use all sorts of chemicals formaldehyde all sorts of things like like a new car smell a uh, new car smell gives me a headache they're using the same kind of things in mattresses to preserve them and then we're just breathing them in for you know eight eight hours every day pretty much mm. and, and what about Sorry, what about pillows as well? If you can. So that's what I was going to say. What's interesting is, don't you know, memory foam pillows, memory foam in shoes. So sketches have insoles that are memory foam inside the shoe. Same thing, same concept. A little different or a little tricky, maybe for people to envision. But if you imagine that your body now has has these bones that are stuck forward, so you collapse. You're, you can notice this because you've got rounded shoulders. Your head's forward. You know, your back probably has too much curve in it, etc. And when you look in the mirror and you're brushing your teeth, you'll see that you're not symmetric. You're like, oh, this collarbone's a bit lower, my shoulder's a bit higher on this side, or I feel a bit twisted. So when you put shoes on that are now memory foam, and you know these, these twists and bends and uh, compensations I talk about happen everywhere. They happen in the cranial bones, they happen in the jaw, they happen in the fingers, they happen right down into your arches, your toes, and your feet. So your whole body can be compensated up. Now, when you put these shoes on, really soft, just like the sleeping example that I gave, where you've got a twist on one side. The shoes, they don't stabilize your body. So when you put the shoe on, it's a micro challenge for your body to actually stabilize itself. So I'm I'm exaggerating it here, but your body will be moving around to try and find a stable spot all the time in the shoes. The likelihood of you pushing a bone further forward when your body's got to look for a stable place is higher. So shoes can really impact us over time as well. Yeah, shoes is definitely something I want to come on to. But on that concept, uh, just going back to sleep, um, sleep posture. Some people people often ask me, how should I sleep? You know, side, back, front. What do you have to say about that? Well, I mean, there's evidence, especially when I was pregnant, you know, sleep on your left side, your stomach. And I think, is it is it around digestion as well? Digestion and circulation 
left for the side left sleeping. side. Yeah. But definitely side sleeping would be number one for me. Back sleeping, not not an issue. It's just that your pillow height has to change between side sleeping and back sleeping. Because of course, side sleeping, you're going to need a lot higher than you are when you lie on your back. Because if you lie on your back with a high pillow, you're going to push your head forward all night. And that's not going to help. Mm. Yeah. Stomach sleeping is, please, please don't. <laughs> just, stop. <laughs> just stop doing what you're doing. I always think the only people who stomach sleep have just passed out. I don't think anyone could actually it's consciously drugs. get into that position. <laughs> What's super interesting at, at work is that, again, working with people in time and correcting their configurations and giving them the right pillow height and they change their mattress, they don't want to sleep on their stomachs anymore. It doesn't feel right for mm. them and it all changes, so... Yeah, you guys do a great sit, sleep, stand workshop where you, you train your clients to sleep. And yeah, on the, on the mattress, I have the ABC mattress that you can buy from their website. It's super firm, non-toxic. But before I could get that, uh, you and Stuart had me sleeping on the floor on a couple of mat, on yoga mats and with rolled up towels. And so, so why do you do that? Just mean? Well, yeah, cruelty. Yeah, exactly. It's like, <laughs> yeah. you know, see if you can do this, but. I think it very much depends on the results we get. So if people, there's always, your body's always giving you clues. Always, 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 always. If, you know, people go, oh, I get out of my car and I can hardly walk. I'm like, well, your car seat clearly didn't do you any favors. Let's see what we can do for your car seat. Same thing with your, you know, your, your sleeping. Oh, I wake up at four or five in the morning. And I've got to get up because I'm in too much pain. I'm like, well, let's take a look at your mattress and your pillow. We do. And that all changes. Um, so putting people on the floor isn't the best experience for them, as you know, because you can have that pressure point of the shoulder or the hip or whatever on the floor. But usually the pain that they come in with is so much better if they sleep on the floor and they get the pillow height moderately right. And they'll say, oh, you know what, I didn't have the best night's sleep because I was sleeping on the floor and was really firm. But I have to say that my back feels so much better or my shoulder. Yes, actually, I woke up and it wasn't as tight. So, And can we cover off the pillow height? What, what, is, what are we talking about there? So there's one thing that I want to say, which is there isn't one pillow that fits all. And if anybody's saying buy this pillow because, you know, it's every, it'll work for everyone, it's, it's bullshit because our bodies are different. Like it's unbelievable how many different configurations I've seen of how twisted up in shapes and sizes and, and, you know, from a, from a mechanical point of view. So you cannot expect pillow height to be the same with anybody. Uh, what we use is a height adjustable pillow. So it has got layers of foam. And when I'm working on someone's body and seeing them twice a week and they're going through transformation, their pillow height probably changes every two or three weeks. Yeah, and it's fascinating when you do that workshop and you see people, when they get the right sleep height, their eyes go from, the, you know, because you're in a kind of bright room, you're in your office and people have their eyes open. Then the, when they find the exact right height, their eyes just like can't stay open. People just become so relaxed. They're just like falling asleep in a, in a crowd of, a crowd of people. It's, it's, it's magic. It's Andy. It's like, it's because of course, when I was studying and learning all of this, this is what I had to learn. You know, this is what I, what I had to study. So what Rich said, where people are, you know, some tiny little person, like smaller than the three of us, is on a stack of a height of pillow about this big. So she's lying on her side, but her head is almost like, because people say, oh, I should just have a pillow that's, you know, from my neck to my shoulder. And that's how really high my pillow should be. Mm -hmm. And it's untrue because it depends so much on the meningeal tension, which I've spoken about, and the mechanics. So she had this massive pillow height, but she was so relaxed and once you do reach a point that your pillow height is good because we go through all these different layers, your eyes just close and it's really quite hard for her to even open her eyes. And you can see her breath is the biggest that she's got and also any aches or pains that she's had are not there. I really, really want to do that exercise now. I can't tell you how much I do, um, especially as I'm about to go to bed. Um, but do, do, do you ever get any um, people who are just kind of curious about this stuff? I mean, like say like me, I mean, I, I don't, I think I've got perfect posture, but it's not causing me any problems that I'm aware of. But I am curious about g going to this stuff and finding out more about how better to treat my body, basically. Do you ever get any people like that coming to you? It's it's on the minimum. So it's the, the smaller sort of numbers. It is really one of my ideal clients, though, for myself, because it's somebody who's not in pain, but just looking to reach their highest potential. 
Mm. So we we basically work with pain, posture, and performance issues. And and what is what is so lovely about it is when you when you don't have pain and we're adjusting you and correcting you, then you're noticing how much better your body functions, even though you're at a pretty good level already. So things like like Rich said, you you're reaching, you know, personal bests with things with with, with like a 10K or or you, you know, your 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 chest press or and so it's it's good to see how and energy levels and even focus and concentration at work, clarity, stuff like that, creativity. Yeah. And going back to that idea of sort of stabilization as well. I think that's a really interesting concept as well. The idea that, you know, when we go into a soft mattress or a soft shoe or even a soft couch, like we don't actually relax. We initially feel relaxed, but then actually it's stressing our body. Can you say more about that? That's so interesting because when, when you're fixing probably six weeks, maybe even less, four to six weeks in when people's body are getting fixed, they're like, I don't even, I don't feel, I get pain on my couch now. And I'm like, she's like, yeah, I didn't have that before. And I'm, yeah, your body was so screwed up before that when you got on the couch, it didn't make any difference. But now that we've fixed you up, sitting on something bad, your body's going, this is not working for me at all. So it's so true. The subtlety of the change in things like breathing rates or even breathing efficiency, you don't even, you don't even know that's happening on the couch. But I mean, think about an a airplane flight. You know, if, you, if you're traveling economy and you're on an airplane flight, you do, you know, four to six hours, maybe even a long haul like South Africa, 11 hours. Nobody gets off the plane feeling great. Nobody gets off the And that's just the, the shape of the actual chair. So a tip there is to actually put the pillow that they give you, which is really small and quite feeble, put it under your butt cheeks so that your hips are higher than your knees when you're sitting. That is that is that really make a huge difference to your spine, posture, function, physiology on the other end. Yeah, and you sell those seat wedges, don't you, for for office chairs, for cars, and everything. So, so why is it important to have our hips above our knees? Basically, when seated, when it's seated, like a, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's a, basically it's like a high heel for your pelvis. So a certain a certain heel for men and women is actually quite beneficial for our posture because it pops it pops us up so we you know for shoes we have these tiny little heel chips that we put especially in barefoot shoes the back of the the shoe to to create um, a lift now in the pelvis when you when the hips are higher than the knees you tilt the pelvis in the direction that props up the spine from the bottom so you you're using less effort to just sit and then of course if you're more upright you're breathing better because your ribs can move and you've got more space for your heart and lungs. So sitting at a desk all day with hips higher than knees is one of the best things you could do. And obviously the position of your your computer is a good, important one as well. Mm. And then what are the best and worst kind of shoes? So Birkenstocks, the uh, worst. worst, Crocs, Crocs. You know, so I see children in Crocs and I – you know, part of me wants to stop all the parents on the street and just say, please don't do this to your child. Child abuse. Um, it's just, you know, and, and it's so well marketed again and so easy yeah. and whatever. And there's all these marketing gimmicks. But again, the shape of the shoe, it forces your body to comp or to look for stabilization all the time, which then increases the chance of you pushing a vertebra forward so they're just learning how to walk some of these kids or even run properly so it's it's it changes the whole biomechanics of their of their bodies so crocs birkenstocks as i said sketches anything with memory memory foam soles a heel is actually not bad for women you know if you if you're tall enough you can have sort of a two inch three inch heel and be okay if you're tall one one and a half inch to someone whose knee is not not so tall important um, and also, you know, people say, well, I tried barefoot shoes, but I was in so much pain. And it's like, well, you know, if your body is really twisted up, you're not going to do well with spending eight hours and commuting in your barefoot shoe. You've got to build up to that. And also, obviously, get some get some treatment first. It's unfortunate that you said Birkenstocks and Crocs, because I'd say they were both the shoes of the summer in the UK. <laughs> I think exactly. that's what I saw most. Exactly. Um, so exactly. any brands of barefoot? shoe you would mention for those of you those who don't know what a barefoot shoe is 
Yeah, so it's a minimal shoe. It doesn't have, and you know, should not have, or we would like it not to have a arch support. Or if you actually look at your shoe really closely, I don't have one with me yet. Um, you look at the heel part of the shoe, you'll notice that there's almost like a trough. So I say to people, you know, Birkenstock's amazing for your feet. Your feet obviously feel great in there because it's supporting the arch. It's got a little space for your heel. It's got a space for your toes. So your feet are fantastic. But the impact that that has on your structure all the way above is not something you want to do. From Right from your breath, again, your efficiency of your breath, and then your posture. So structurally changing you over time. But, so, you know, so yeah. five a barefoot – um, we enjoy those shoes. We enjoy Groundies. Groundies is a German brand. I'm using some Field Grounds, which is UK based. And there's so many more coming out. So every time I look at a barefoot shoe, I'm really just going for flat, flexible, and wide. And no support on the arch and no negative heel or trough happening in the shoe. Okay. Great advice. <laughs> All right. Well, um, yeah, we've covered the the sleep, the sleeping, the standing. That's that's the uh, one thing. Yeah, we I want to ask about standing. Standing. Yeah. How do we stand? Should we stand? Well, that's you know what I said in the beginning is that people are like, "How should I be? What should my posture look like?" And they ask me, and I go, "Well, it's sh- it's not something conscious. <laughs> it should be unconscious, and it should be there." So you know. What I do is restore these curves. And people then say also something like, well, should I have a standing desk? Now, a standing desk is great, but you'll notice that a certain number of time in to your meeting or whatever you're doing, you'll start fidgeting. So either leaning on one leg or crossing one over. Or What I do is I, I end up opening my legs quite wide so that I can like leaning into. So as soon as you notice yourself compensating, that's those are compensations, sit. Just sit, just change. It's the change between sitting and standing that your body wants. It's not so much, you know, oh my God, I sit for eight days, it's a, um, eight hours, it's a problem. I'm going to stand for eight hours. It's not that. It's the movement that your body wants. So we just encourage people, you know, get up, use the toilet, get a drink, get a coffee, get a tea, come back, and then, you know, change standing, sitting, standing, sitting. But ideally, I mean, a mechanical, biomechanical position of standing is that your your feet are directly under your hips, your, your you know, your Feet are turned out at about 10 degrees on either side. Arms are relaxed by your side and you're looking straight ahead. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's interesting you say that, that mm, there is no perfect posture because I was listening to this football podcast and they're always like, oh, Phil Foden, he has the perfect <laughs> posture. But I don't think he does. I think he's got slightly <laughs> like Lord Dotic spine. Um, and then also on the topic of posture, I often get Instagram adverts for like this kind of like, almost looks like a, a bra but for 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 men and women that brings your shoulders back what do you think about those those kind of yeah do you, do you want me to say that i've got one or should i just leave that off this episode <laughs> yeah. well i mean i always say to people what are your goals you know if your goal is to be upright for an evening because you've got an event you know wear the back brace but if your goal is to be pain free muscle tension free and be upright then look for another way i mean if you think about you know, wearing a cast on your arm for six weeks because you broke a bone. When you take that cast off because you haven't moved those muscles, you've atrophied. So if someone's wearing a brace for X amount of time in a day, the muscles aren't being activated at all, some of them, and there'll be such an imbalance there as well. So it can create such a knock-on effect of wearing those braces. If that's what you're looking for to change your posture, I, I don't I don't promote those as well. Um. Could I, you, you touched on um, flying and I'm just conscious in the age of like digital nomads and people working from loads of different environments. Could you give kind of practical tips for people who are maybe sitting on four or five different chairs a week, sleeping maybe in a couple of beds in, in a week? What are, what are kind of things you can take with you um, or so, practical tips like hips above above knees? Yes. And that kind of thing? Yeah, so hips above knees. So for me, you know, if I can't travel with my wedge um, with me, which just, you know, looks like this. I've actually got it on this chest. You'll have to describe this for the yeah. listeners, Rich. Okay. It's like oh, a yeah. triangular cushion. It's pretty tough. Um, it's it's wedge-shaped. That's yeah. why it's called wedge. a wedge. Um, and okay. it covers you, your chair, maybe half half the chair or three-quarters of a chair. Great so description. So on yeah. most, most chairs. I have them in my car. I've got, I'm sitting on one right now, actually, uh, in my office. So bonus points for me. Bonus points for you. 
So if you can't do that, obviously, I use, you know, if I go to her theater or if I'm, like you say, working in a space where I know the chair is rubbish, I will roll up my scarf or my jacket and I'll stick it under my butt cheeks so that my hips are higher than my knees. You know, same thing in a, in a taxi or something. I'll be like, no, I can't sit like this. So I'll roll something up, stick it under my bum. Um, so that would be the one way that I would, you know, get around a chair that isn't so good. And also, depending on what's going on on your spine, you can sit to the edge of the chair so that, you, you know, if it's a terrible, terrible chair. You f- I find that a lot of bar stools are a problem, you know, with where there's no back. So when you're sitting for a long time and you have no support, it's it's not ideal. You know, mm-hmm. people will say to me, when I'm working, should I sit on an exercise ball? And I'm like, no, absolutely not. I mean, you can do it for a period of time if you want to, 20 minutes or something like that, but it's not something to sit on for eight hours. Why is that? You know, you're not giving your body a chance to be as supportive. I mean, it, you're not stable. So the whole time it's it's obviously challenged, which is what you want to do when you want to challenge those muscles. But I wouldn't do that for eight hours. You know, your spine, if you're going to sit and focus for a while, you'll need some support there. So the position of your hips higher than your knees balances your pelvis, props up your spine without effort. So your muscles are not working as hard. Um, what else you said? So in hotel rooms, if the bed now, you'll know if the bed is a problem for your body because you won't feel good in bed. Mm. I mean, I always remember going to my first night away of being a new mom. And I was like, I'm away from my baby. I'm going to sleep so well. I'm going to have no interruptions. And I get in this hotel room and I'm lying in the bed and I'm like, crap. I just, my, I just started to get like growing pains. My legs were sore. I didn't know what to do. I kept tossing and turning. I slept on the floor, froze my ass off, but I still <laughs> slept on the floor and I didn't get any sleep. But yes, so beds, you will know if the bed is not good for you. If you can't fall asleep, you're tossing and turning and you've got any sort of tension or aches or pains, then sleep on the floor. Pillow height, um, I'll use towels. So bath towels, something in the bathroom. And if the pillow isn't doing what I want it to do. And the three things I would look at, one lying on my side is the position of where my upper shoulder is. So if your upper shoulder, the one you're lying on, the opposite one, if that's falling forward and your hand is going underneath your chin to prop up your head when you sleep, the pillow's way too sm- uh, uh, low, way too low. So you want to look for this shoulder, the top shoulder to be in a neutral position. If it's too far back when you're lying on your pillow and you almost want to fall onto your back, the pillow is usually too high. So those are kind of just some guidelines for that. And so use a towel from the bathroom and just create these levels and just go up and down really slowly. And your body can ascertain a change of different pillow height to the height of a piece of a paper. So when I say to people, you know, go up in pillow height, I'm not saying go home and add a whole pillow or, you know, go down and take away a pillow. I'm saying go home and put a tea towel underneath your pillow and see if that helps you sleep better awesome and just so rich doesn't have to ask the question about breath which he does all the time obviously rich brings everything back to the breath you mentioned breath earlier can you talk about the role that the breath has in the body in the work you do so we use it as a observational tool it's probably one of our pow- most powerful observational tools when we are standing because that's how we do most of our treatments we don't have to but standing is best We're looking at the movement of the chest, the ribs, the first rib, which is actually, no one really knows this, but the first rib is actually under your collarbone. And it goes around and actually connects to the back of your neck. So people don't know that, but it goes right around and connects to the back of your neck. So we're looking at the position of the first rib, the second rib, and then all the ribs that attach underneath that in your chest bone to see how each side is moving and obviously how much they're moving. The ribs move like bucket handles. So if we don't see that movement being symmetrical or as open, as free, as long as it could be, there's an issue. And every mechanical adjustment that we do, we then compare. So we're like, okay, that's a better breath. Oh, that's a worse. Okay, let me, you know, let me try something else. So the breath is an observational tool. And it's probably one of the first things, Rich, I don't know if you can vouch for this, but it's probably one of the first most home or hard hitting results that you notice about ABC is when you have that first rib maneuver and you have a few things done of how much easier, more efficient, lighter, bigger, longer your breath is. 
Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a really interesting diagnostic tool. You know, you, your body is struggling if it can't take a deep breath and going back to self being in the back of a, an Uber or something, you know, in, in a little Prius, because I find that position, I get really anxious in Ubers because my knees are so high and well, normally like, <laughs> yeah, they, they, I, yeah, my knees are high. So I, I often hit sit to the side and, and, and do some breath work to, to calm myself down there. But, um, yeah, the, the breath work you do or the, you is about, is this person breathing maximally? Is there something restricting their breath? And it's a, it's a really good telltale sign. So, yeah. Um, is there anything else you want to share, Natalie, anything else you think we haven't covered? I just think that it's important that people know that you can change the shape of your spine. Like I, I, it's fascinating how many people just don't think that you can. You know, there's a lot of young people, particularly that are coming in that are kyphotic. So that means they've got like that bump on the back of their neck or they're really hunched over with their shoulders because technology has, has played a bigger role in their lives than say for, for us. And people just don't think that that can be changed. And so really it's just to say that it's possible. It's possible mm. to transform your spine. So there's hope. Yeah, that's a great message to leave us with. Thanks for that. <laughs> um, and where do we where do we find you, Natalie? So yeah, Spiro Health is in London in Putney, on the high street there. And you know we have a great website, as I said, with different resources on it. We on Instagram as well at Spiro Health. That's my two main channels. Yeah, yeah. We do we do these sit sleep standing sessions actually, and we do them uh, virtually as well. So you can join from around the world. Obviously, the time difference might be an issue, but we do offer it online and virtually too, which could be quite beneficial for any questions. And you, you get to see us demonstrating on people's bodies. Mm. And for people not local to London, for people in California, I see Jane Baxley at White Oak Chiropractic in Vacaville, and she's amazing, just like Natalie. And there is a website, isn't there? Is it ABC, where there's like a, a map for people around the world who want to find local practitioners? Yes, so it's the ABC provider map. Uh, for me, I'm affiliated to ABCE, which is ABC Europe. I know there's ABC Aust in Australia as well. Um, ABC International. So just type that in. There's a there's a great educational website called meningealrelease.com. So meningealrelease.com. You can put that in the notes. I'll send it to you. Yeah. Great. Fantastic. All right. Thank you very much, Natalie. Yeah. Thanks so much for giving us your time. Thanks, Rich. No, much appreciated. Thanks so much. In conclusion, no, we're not going to do in conclusion. I really hate it when people finish a, 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 a whatever, a, a book. By saying with, what you should have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Or they, and as if you're not smart enough to pick up what you want to pick up. Yeah. And also, I think the conclusion is different from ev for everyone, isn't it? Someone it might already do all of that and then they'd be like, oh, that's good. I'm doing everything right. And I do ABC and my spine's perfect and I sleep perfectly and I stand perfectly. But I think yeah. a lot of people would have taken, some good nuggets of wisdom from an incredibly intelligent lady. So yes. thank you very much to Natalie. Yes. And whilst we spoke all about the positives of ABC, which I mean, they are pretty much all positives. Uh, I think it's also important because we, we are, we are trying to make this show about being balanced and not just being overly salesy and hypey. And I hopefully, hopefully that episode wasn't too salesy and hype, hypey, but no treatment works for everyone. You know, this, this treatment really helped my back. It helped my shoulder, but it hasn't, hasn't helped my hip. Um, my hip, as I've mentioned, has lost labrum. It, this treatment has limitations. It can't regrow labrum and cartilage like maybe stem cells can. So it's possible that people will try ABC and they won't get as phenomenal benefits as i did and they'll need something else but i think it's definitely worth a try it's pretty minimally invasive it doesn't require flying to mexico and uh having being put under general anesthetic and having stem cells it's certainly a lot cheaper than that as well mm. um i was disappointed to hear that birkenstocks and crocs are no good for your feet because i feel like they've both had a real resurgence really? over the summer really and certainly the um well, I don't own either. But I'm I not just... disappointed. I'm glad. They're very ugly and they need to go. <laughs> <laughs> Chefs around the world would be devastated by the Crocs one. Yeah, big time. 
um no very very interesting stuff practical tips um go find natalie on instagram and check out those videos on abc they sound really good as a minimum or maybe go and see her at spyro in putney big time all right thank you andy thank you natalie and thank you listener you find us you find us find us on instagram at the breath geek at andy sam and at thebreathgeek.com and on all good podcast hosting sites brilliant well done did i did i get the voiceover gig nailed it speak to you next time bye thanks for listening bye